everyone, and welcome to our first September edition of Book Break. Today, my guest is Megan, and she and I are going to be talking about some of our recent reads. Megan's a library page, also in school to become a library media specialist, correct? Yep, yep. yeah. I'm just finishing up my second round of glasses. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she's also one of our original teen advisory board members <laughs> um, who came back to work at the library. We love to see it. So, Megan, welcome. And tell me about some of the stuff you like to read, because you're really an avid reader. Yeah, I am. Thank you for having me on. I'm super excited. Um, so I'm a big romance reader. I would say that's my predominant genre. But when I do stray, it'll be a mystery, a thriller. Um, I do. I have always loved fantasy. Mm-hmm. I will say I've kind of been moving away from that genre, um, which is not like... I, that I love going away from it, but it's just some, like the series have been so drawn out, like drawn out, I'm sure as you've seen. Oh yeah. But I just don't have, I don't have the patience to like get into one and then have it go on. Oh, I know. Especially when each book is like 600 and some pages. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of my favorites um, from Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout, like now it's like an eight book series and I've only read the first three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, pretty much I'm a big uh, romance, mystery um, I know a couple times I'll stray out, like just to like t- like traditional fiction, but right. I kind of like to stay in my bubble. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I've I've found I've been reading more romance, which is kind of shocking. But I think every now and then we like to shake it up. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You get tired of reading the same things. Yeah. So it's funny because I saw a weather forecast today that said we're in for a week of. Um, pumpkin spice latte <laughs> weather. Did you see that? I st- I'll- yeah, I'll try to find the graphic because I think it was on like News Ten or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. Pumpkin spice for which yes. is nice. That is nice because <laughs> it's like sixties here. It's mm-hmm. overcast. It's been rainy, so it definitely you're starting to feel the fall vibes. Yeah, and that know? makes me want to pick up a mystery. Like, oh, I more know. Than anything mystery and witches for yep, me. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> witch romance. We'll go into witch. Yes. Romance. Yes. But um, so are you a pumpkin spice person? I'm not actually. I'm not a huge pumpkin person. Yeah. I like pumpkin bread. But okay. Um, I don't really drink coffee. I'll yeah. do it like a tea in the, once we get cooler, it'll be tea or a nice hot chocolate. All right. But not much coffee. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. So my first one is kind of, I think, perfect for this change in weather. It was, it was really different. It was called We Burn Daylight by Brett Anthony Johnson. And it came out at the end of July. So it kind of reimagined that government branch Davidian conflict and a Romeo and Juliet story. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is not like your typical mashup. So it's the story of two teenagers, Roy and Jay. And Roy is, it's set in Waco in the late 1990s. Roy is the sheriff's son. And Jay, her mom, has decided to follow this guy called The Lamb from California to his new place in Waco, Texas. So the way he makes his money is he works gun shows and sells, you know, rifles, ammunitions, and all these other kinds of things. So Roy's father, as sheriff, has been out there a couple of times. They're kind of watching things. And lo and behold, at one of the gun shows, Roy and Jay meet. And of course, you know, they start to fall in love. So It goes on where, of course, he gets more and more entrenched in this savior business. And I don't remember. Did you follow the 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 David Koresh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think news wise and media wise, that was a huge thing. This siege is is this based on? Is this a true? Is this a true story? It's not a true story. Because where you're going with it makes it sound like an alt history kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of that conflict seen through the eyes of these two young people that are involved. Oh, man. So Now, is this, is this YA or is it just... No, it's adult. It's adult based on like younger like teens, you said? Yes. Right? Okay, cool. Yeah, because it, it's really told from the viewpoint of Roy some chapters and Jay some chapters. Okay. So you see this girl, and she's actually pretty sharp. Like her mom is falling for this hook, line, and sinker. She leaves her husband, gets in the car, takes her daughter drives across country wow. but but Jay is very worldly like mm-hmm. she she can see through what he's doing and she's also she sees how he approaches other people particularly young women in the compound and children start appearing and she's 
always got her guard up. Like she's she's smart. Um, she gets jobs like transporting the weapons and so forth so she can meet up with Roy in town. Hmm. Um, Very interesting. And Roy is seeing it from the perspective of his dad and law enforcement where he knows something good is, you know, nothing good is going to happen at the end of this story. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, it, oh, I don't want to give too much away. Right. <laughs> well, we know how it ends. Well, yeah, you know how it ends in the real life, but you don't know how it ends for these two. Um, and also, interspersed in the chapters between these two, you have excerpts from a podcast that is taking place. Oh, I where, love when they do that. Me I love too. That. Yeah. So they have like different people like Roy's father is interviewed, you know, um, other people like escaped cult members, uh, some that are in jail. <laughs> um, all these different people are interviewed and that gives you another layer mm -hmm. of introspection kind of on this conflict. That's, this just moved right to number one in my list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I, I had to good read. When, when you said that this is what you're going to be talking about, I was like, I've never heard of this. I mean, I kind of live in like my little romance bubble, like I right. said. So I was like, I had to check it out and I put it, I did put it on my it's on my goodreads i think right now <laughs> yeah so would you describe it as overarchingly romantic or all parts like almost dystopian in a way and yeah kind of no i i definitely wouldn't peg this even though they kind of claim it has a romeo and juliet angle as this is not a typical romance gotcha. like we're not having like the you know too much love scenes yeah. i mean there are different scenes but the story is really how these two people and everyone else gets affected by one of these tragedies. And the interesting thing is I listened to a nonfiction book called Cultish, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was the language of cults and how important language is to leaders. Yep. And even like it goes into sales and even some of the things like the exercise places nowadays. So sure. I found that that was a really good companion read for oh, this. I bet. Um, yeah, I think it would make a great book for a book discussion. There's a lot to dive yeah. into here. But huh, so that's yeah, that's my first one. What's yeah, awesome. your first one? So my first one, it's Love Letters to a Serial Killer. Ooh. Um, the author is evading me right now, which is awful because it's her debut novel. Um, and when I picked it up, I kind of, so the cover, it's bright pink. It's got like fun covers. And I picked up and I kind of expected it to be more of like a, I don't know if you ever read, um, I actually think it's a similar title, Love Letters to a Serial Killer, I think is another book. And um, it's more of like a fan, like a romance type thing. Mm -hmm. And so I picked this one up and I was like, oh, it might be kind of silly, you know, a little comedic. But so basically, so this girl, Hannah, so she is kind of stuck in her life. She's not really happy where she is at work, at home, her relationship. Um, she just got out of a relationship. So she joins this online kind of group. I think it's through Facebook. And... Um, there's been some women disappearing like throughout their area and their bodies keep turning up in the like canal like in her area oh no and so she's like it's very similar there's it get to be like repeats so she gets really invested in this group of like of, of other women that are like we need to find these people so that she comes like her focus so she posts on her instagram like bring these women home help us find them and eventually they arrest this man who is connected to all of them so one of them is like he, um, they were her, his personal trainer. Another one is like a work associate, a neighbor. Um, he goes to her gas station all the time. And so she, the woman, Anna, is kind of like, oh, my God, I should have known this. But then she kind of gets a little interested. You know, he's a handsome, younger guy. And everyone kind of would, wouldn't have expected him. And so they arrest him. And she ends up going to all the courts. So she sits in on all the hearings all of the testaments and she's listening and she's like, you know what? I hate this guy. He definitely did it. But she also is kind of like falling in love with him a little bit. Uh oh. And Weird. which before all of this, she actually wrote him a letter too. So once they arrested him, she wrote him a letter to the jail and said, like, you're disgusting. I can't believe you did this. Like, we all hate you. And he kind of writes back. So they, before she ends up falling along with all the courts, so they keep letters back and forth. And then he's like, will you be my girlfriend? Like, I need someone on the outside to kind of help me through this. And she's like, mm, of course, because she's miserable. Oh she's not happy at all. What does this remind you of? I don't know. How Ted, about, yeah. Yep. Ted Bundy? Yep. So I was going to say yep. Ted Bundy. Yeah. So, and the whole time she's saying to herself, because it's just her point of view. So, like, you read his letters. But 
Um, and the whole time she's like, I'm not going to be one of those Ted Bundy girlfriends, but of course that's kind of what happens. I can fix him. Yeah. So, (laughs) so she gets very invested, but also kind of in the back of her mind, she's kind of like into like the darkness that he kind of brings because like he did do all these things to the women. Everyone believes at least. But so she starts hanging out with his family a little bit, gets a little closer. And then I wish, I wish that I could tell everyone what happened, but of course I don't want (laughs) to give it away. But I remember I was reading, we were out of town and I was reading on the ride home and it was one of those like, oh my God moments. <laughs> and I'm in the car losing my mind because in the back of your mind, you kind of know what's going to happen. Right. It's like, of course I know. Because at the same time, so all the court is unfolding. There's also every couple of often like a, in the present chapter where she has been kidnapped. Oh, and, oh dear. You know, oh dear, so dear, dear. That's, that's also going on at the time. And again, it's one of those like, of course I know what's going on, but then big twist big twist at the end it was just i don't know i i remember i'm i don't normally write like so i use goodreads i don't normally write mm-hmm. reviews but i did for this one all i wrote was twisted <laughs> because it really was so unexpected i was i was just in like hooked and it was so a debut novel so i um posted it on my i have a bookstagram so i shared right. it there and um one of the one of my friends slid up and was like i'm reading this right now too like this is insane <laughs> so we were talking about it and it's just it was just crazy. I I would definitely read it again just to kind of pick up on things that I missed. But right. it was oh, I, very I, good. I might have to add that one when yeah. I'm in a very dark. It and looks it, like the author's Tasha Coriel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which I didn't. I her name was in my mind, but I didn't want to say the wrong thing and then right. be like, oh no. Yeah. But it looks I, like there's a bunch of books out there with that title. But yeah. Yeah. Because I the, I even read like just like a romance. I'm pretty sure of the same name and like where she thought her neighbor was a serial killer, but no, he just was like a hermit. Yeah. He just like never went out of the house. And she was like immediately, you know, like in in the like true crime era, you know, like, but it was just, it was very cool. I would definitely recommend it. And it pops right out too. It's got a bright pink cover. You know, it has, you know, like when they like cut out the magazine letters. Right. So it's got that, but it was just very. Let me, let me ask you guys a question. Maybe this isn't appropriate, but I have to ask. When you read a book like this, what's your week like? After you finish the book, do you look at everybody with kind of a side eye <laughs> and a heightened sense of suspicion? Um, I hate to say no because <laughs> I feel like I should. Now, like now that you bring it up, it's like yeah, maybe I should. But yeah. I'm very much a put down a book, pick up a new one. Right. Like even so, we were out of town, and I probably read like five books because I I read pretty quick. I kind of skim, mm-hmm. which is not what my friends like um <laughs> but like I'm a very like dialogue reader so like if there's not a lot of dialogue I'm kind of skimming through it okay. but I'm very much like a, I've closed that one I was like here someone else read this so I can talk about it and then immediately move on like even right now I was glad that I was able to recall so many details because I read so many books since then <laughs> I know that that's like the the curse of a, a book reader yeah you know that's why I have to have notes right because I start mixing everything up I don't know but like if you read like a true crime I like would you kind of be like <laughs> <Yeah>. one eye <laughs> yeah probably a little bit yeah it's interesting because a lot of books are focusing on him or that type of character mm-hmm. lately right. there was one called bright young women that mm-hmm. I read and uh, that was like a takeoff on because the judge actually you know, remember he was like enamored with Ted Bundy. He was like, "Oh, you're such a yeah. bright young man." He I- was like, "If under different circumstances, I'd like to have you practice in my courtroom." Right. I'm just like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. And that's like the exact feeling that I had like reading this book because like there were other women too that were like following it along, and like one of them was like a mother, like she's like an older woman, and she's like, "I just believe he's like a good man," but uh. I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> But then again, like when you get to the end, you you kind of want to like reread the whole thing to kind of see Very what you cool. missed. I don't yeah, know. right. Yeah. Okay. I definitely got to add this one now. Thanks a lot, Megan. Of course. <laughs> All right. So my next one is called Mercury by Amy Jo Burns. This one came out in January, and I've kind of had it on my shelf for a while and just was in the mood for something different. So this one is kind of like a blend of if you like family drama literary, a little bit of romance, and a lot like coming of age. So we start the story. It's 17-year-old Marley West. She and her mom move to the town of Mercury, Pennsylvania. Her mom is a traveling nurse, and there's no dad in the picture. Um, She loves her mom, 
unconditionally, but she really wants to be like a part of something bigger. Like she wants a family. She wants to be part of her town. Mm -hmm. They've moved a lot. So she sits down at this baseball game right after, you know, not long after she gets into town. And there are these two brothers playing in the outfield. And they start having a fight. And the mom gets up. She makes them stop. And immediately, Marley is, like, attracted to one of these brothers. So it's the Joseph family. They own a um, roofing business in Pennsylvania. And they're very, like, central to this town. Like, the mother's involved in everything. And the father is a prominent businessman. And there were three sons. So over the course of this novel, she kind of has a different relationship with each one of these sons. So the one that she's first attracted to is not the one that she stays with. Mm. She ends up marrying one of the brothers. And then the youngest brother, who was kind of like an oops baby, you know, he's a lot younger than the other ones. She kind of takes him under her wing, so to speak, because he doesn't feel like he fits into the family. Um, everybody has a secret. You know, of it's one of these <laughs> novels that everybody has a secret, a lot of family dysfunction, a lot of fights. Um, but at the center of it all is this business and kind of the sacrifices that people make. And you don't really know about all the characters and what they're dealing with until the end. So, of course, Marley gets pregnant. She gets married. And the story kind of goes from there. Hmm. But... Um, I'd say it's kind of a slow burn family drama, okay. if you like that type of thing. A lot of very realistic characters. All these people are flawed. You know, there's no mm -hmm. perfect, wonderful person in here. But there are a lot of good like side relationships. Like Marley develops a really close friendship with a girl in high school who ends up having like her own hair salon, and that's kind of like her rebounding place a lot of times when things start to go bad for her. But um yeah, I, it interested in me more than I thought. Yeah. So um, I like this one. It was also a book of the month club pick. That's where I saw it. So yeah. Is there any tension like amongst the brothers? Like, oh that yes. That just sounds oh, like yeah, unavoidable. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the the one brother kind of never really got over the fact that she chose another one. Of course. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So hmm. definitely and. You know, here you are at the family table because they all right. like have dinner together, mm -hmm. and there's your brother with the girl <laughs> that you fell in love with ouch. first. Yeah, <laughs> big ouch. That's Shakespearean too, in a way. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I kind of got that kind of vibe, uh, like family tragedy mm -hmm. type of thing. So, very interesting. That's another one. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna get Sean to read some of these books, Megan. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on board for the first two. Yeah, honestly, that's that love letters one sounds like a blast. Yeah, I know it's making me want to pick it up just right now again. <laughs> yeah, Sean and I are gonna be running out there trying to find it on the shelf, <laughs> I knocking know. each other over. I don't know why. Have you ever read Winter's Bone? Yes. Oh man, the the Mercury. I don't know why it's giving me glimpses of it. Right. Maybe it's just that Appalachian sort of. I don't know setting as character sort of thing yes you know and, and family tragedy Definitely. which there's a lot of that oh and i i like that one i i love a good book kind of set in that part of the country 100%, too yeah yeah i'm very into that so yeah very yeah interesting you, you had me in appalachia yeah, and, you know, <laughs> anything i know it gets tossed around a lot but the noir sort of yes. aspect of things where things are very dark and sort of humorous but at the same time it, they shouldn't be right you know it's almost like a gallows humor sort of yeah that's it's, kind of what really gets gets me going is yes that kind of i like a, that a kind of a southern noir too. yeah especially like within yeah. like a family i feel like it's the type of thing you don't want to see in your family of course so right right i'm gonna read about it <laughs> right but at the same time, you could probably think of a lot of families that would have these issues. Because right. no family is perfect, yeah. you know. No, very so. interesting. Yeah, especially when it runs counter to the appearances. Correct. You know, like, and yeah. that's what was so cool about, like, Scarlet Letter. Yeah. You know, everything just looks great. But really, it's full of turmoil. And it's best to be voyeuristic <laughs> and rather than having to go through it in your own family. Yeah, you know. that's right. <laughs> the hypocrisy runs deep. Yeah, it does. <laughs>
And actually, that kind of small town kind of ties into good to my next one. So my next one, it's um, a novel love story by Ashley Poston. So she also wrote um, The Dead Romantics and The Seven Year Slip. Oh, I've read both um, of those. So I like them. I know, like, they're kind of falling under that, like, romanticy mm-hmm. category that has kind of been coming out lately. And I loved the first two. Um, I rec- like, recommended them friends, family, and this new one when I picked it up. So it is um, like another small town. But the twist is this woman, um, Elsie. So she is driving. She's going on this big road trip um, by herself. So normally her and her friends take this every year camping trip. And this year her friends weren't able to make it um, just like family things, work things. And again, this is kind of another character that like her life right now is kind of in shambles. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she goes, she's like, I'm going to take this by myself. So I'm on a road trip. I'm going to do it. But of course her car breaks down, you know, in a storm, it's raining and a man comes to save her and brings her into this town. And when she wakes up the next day, he's kind of taking her around like to lunch to like make sure her car can get fixed. And there's kind of some similarities rising in this town to her favorite book series. Okay. So she, it turns out, as she kind of follows through all of this, meets some people, she realizes that the characters from her book live in this fictional town. And the only thing is the man that she met that saved her, so his name's Anders, is he's not in any of the books. So that's kind of the twist there. So in my mind, um, I picture very much like Stars Hollow, like Gilmore Girls, like right. small town. And again, like the name is failing me because of course. Um, but so it's just all these characters are there. And this book series, it's like an interconnected one. So each book series follows like a different couple. And of course, they're all like happily ever after. Like someone owns like the bakery. Someone owns the restaurant, the car mechanic. And they have these like signature foods. So it's this picturesque town. But the whole time, Anders is trying to kind of send her on her way because she doesn't fit in there. But the thing is, like, he doesn't fit in either. And to go along with this, too, so the author of the book series passed away. Never, she never got to finish the last book. So oh, wow. she's trying to see, like, where the characters are now because it should be perfect, right? Because all their stories had a happy ending. But in this town kind of no one really seems to be happy anymore it rains every day without fail all day every day you know even the must be in new york (laughs) (laughs) even the happiest characters are now sad like and she kind of throws a mix in where it's like you don't belong here so everything is changing because of you and anders kind of ends up throwing a little twist in there too which is really cool and again i wouldn't i wouldn't give anything away because that's kind of what changed the book for me I honestly wasn't loving it as I was reading. Um, Compared to her other books, it fell a little flat. But then they kind of threw this little wrench in at the end. Because I was getting to a point where I was like, everyone's happy. You know, of course, now Elsie and Anders are together and everyone's happy. But then I still had all this book to go. And it kind of turns out being he's connected to the author, not to the books. So it kind of falls on them. Then, like, they get to change what happens in the town. Uh And... So all her books kind of have that like supernatural kind of romance twist. And I ended up loving it in the end, Um, even though it kind of I kind of struggled through it a little bit. Well, that's really funny because I started this one. Yeah. And I had to put it down Mm -hmm. because it didn't grab me. And the other thing is the way she described Anders, Mm -hmm. like very light blonde hair. I I was picturing Draco Malfoy. And once (laughs) I went there, I just, I was like, okay, I'm done It's funny you say that because when I read, I don't really visualize anything in my head, which makes it kind of boring. But so like when they do like fan casts and things like that, I'm always falling kind of flat. But um, it's funny you say that. And like they, they work in a bookstore. That was the other thing too is that like drew me in was, you know, like he owns a bookstore, so it always seems like it'll be a little picturesque, kinda cute. But I I admit I like and I feel the same way. It kind of I kinda struggled through it in the beginning. Okay. Which was really disappointing. It was one of my anticipated reads for the year. Yeah, it was one um, of mine too. Especially after her first two, which are just amazing. I just right. I loved them both. Yeah. But I will I the the ending did get a little bit I did save it a little bit. Okay. <laughs> maybe I'll pick it back so up. So if you go back, yeah. maybe a little Draco, Draco in there, but still kind of worth it in the end. <laughs> yeah, it kind of gave me Brigadoon vibes, mm. if you like old musicals, because mm. that one was the uh, same kind of thing. Like, she goes off into Scotland in this mysterious town that's only, yeah, you know, comes alive every hundred years or something like that. But. Which, anything like that just is immediately hooked. Like, I'm hooked. Right. But I, I feel like it could have been done just a little bit better. But, like, I still wanted to talk about it because I love the author. And, you know, as a new book, it was still really, like, very interesting. Like, her ideas 
just never run out. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my last one, I, I just realized all of mine are pretty depressing today. <laughs> I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, my, my November melancholy, I guess, appeared <laughs> early this year. So my last one is called The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Bremer. And this one was really strange. It's, I, I started thinking I wasn't going to finish this one, but then I did get hooked mm -hmm. to a point. So Clover is a death doula. Oh, which um, that's the second time I've heard that today. Today, really? yeah. <laughs> wow, Sean, and it's not even. I know it's only. <laughs> it it's is like... ten thirty six a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the first time I'm hearing it ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so her first death was when she was in kindergarten. Her teacher, who was in the middle of story time, dies in front of the class. Wow. Okay. Next thing, when she was only six, her parents died. Like. Never, they went on a trip to China and then never returned. So she's pulled out of her classroom. So death obviously is a big part of her life. And that's yeah. when I first started reading this. I was like, wow, <laughs> I don't know if I can go on with yeah, this, oh my you know. Goodness. But um, her grandfather ends up coming and getting Clover and moves her to New York City. So she has a good life with him. Like they start a tradition where they go out to breakfast every Sunday and they go to the bookstore and pick a book. And, you know, she she went off to school. She went to, I think, McGill College in Canada. Um, she was going to, she did study death. So this has always been on her brain. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to be, her grandfather was a university professor at Columbia, I wow. believe. So that's that was her path. So she was off traveling the world, studying different types of you know cultures and everything and her grandfather passes away mm. so and he left her his apartment in new york which i guess is a big deal um because you can't find you know <laughs> 2024 it is i'll tell you that <laughs> yeah this is true so um but she decides to change her career a little bit and become a death doula which is i guess a person who can be hired by a family to kind of ease the transition of a person. And it can be anything from helping them get their last wishes in order to sitting with them. In some cases, she did pro bono. Like if nobody, if someone at the hospital didn't have anyone, like they would contact a group of people, and Clover was one of those people. Wow. And um, so she would sit with them. And she oftentimes would talk to these people and find out, like, if they had a regret. Mm -hmm. So she had a notebook of regrets, and she tried to take these people's regrets and incorporate them in her life. Wow. Like how she would, you know, if somebody had wanted to, I don't know, get in touch with someone, and she, she would just try to do all of these things in honor of these people. So she attended something, and this is something else I didn't know about, a, a death cafe. So... <laughs> And, of course, at the death cafe, she meets this young man, mm -hmm. and he's interested in her. But she's kind of pushed people away for so long. She's probably in her 30s. Yeah. Never really had a relationship. I almost started to wonder, like, if perhaps she might be on the spectrum or something. Mm -hmm. She definitely was not very social. But she starts to realize is that now that her grandfather's passed away, she needs to change things. Yeah. So she goes out on a date with this guy. Um, then she gets a new tenant in her building who is kind of this wild and crazy girl that, <laughs> you know, befriends her. Um, so her life starts changing. Well, the reason why the young man came to the cafe is his grandmother's dying, and he's from, like, a very old money family, and no one will talk about it. No one, you know, it just, death is not brought up, and he's not comfortable with that. So he hires her to sit with his grandmother. Mm. Um and his grandmother turns out to be a really interesting person. She was like a photojournalist, wow. um, kind of in the Martha Gellhorn, mm -hmm. I guess, era. But she had to give it all up because her parents wanted her to have this society wedding mm -hmm. and women didn't work. And that just was not a part of the plan. Mm -hmm. So unbeknownst to her family, she had a great love affair when she was overseas doing this photography. <laughs> so Clover's mission 
is to find this man. Wow. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So I, I'll leave you with that. But Ooh, um, I, well, I am hooked. <laughs> yeah. This sounds amazing. Yeah. It was it was really good. Yeah. And it doesn't really turn out exactly the way you think it's going to okay. turn out. Like you know, at first I'm, you know, I don't want to say too much because, right. but um. It is very hopeful in the end, and I liked how she kind of worked through things mm-hmm. and started to see that maybe she's put herself in too much of a box yeah. and has to has to live a little bit. Well, I mean, so. how can you not after all, like when you started talking about it, I was like, oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. Oh, I know. And, and that's what I did. But you get to this one point, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This has... You know, this yeah. is interesting. This has promise. So, is it like a little bit of like found family in there, kind of? Kind of, yeah, a little okay. bit. Yeah, well, the um, I'm hooked. <laughs> the grandmother. Her name is Claudia. She mm-hmm. definitely becomes like since Clover really didn't have a mother, or you know, her grandfather. Yeah. I think was single at that time when he adopted her. So mm, yeah, it was a it was a great figure. relationship. Wow. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Very interesting. What's your last one? So my last one, I you read it. It's um, Divine Rivals. Oh, I love this by one. Rebecca Ross. Um, so I picked it up actually for my class. It was um, like teen literature, so mm-hmm. YA lit, which like I'm a pretty big YA reader. Anyways, I don't. I find them very interesting, and I this one was very popular on like Book Talk and all of that fun stuff. And I had kind of avoided it. I don't know why, but so I picked it up and fell in love. So it's a YA like fantasy enemies to lovers and it is kind of set in the midst of this huge like god's war so um there's like the people that live like the gods above and the gods below and two of them like they were in love he betrayed her and so then now they're in this huge war and so people are called kind of by like the one um who does like the she is like a music god and so she'll call people to be like her soldiers and it kind of starts off and the main character iris is sending off her older brother to be to fight in the war and he has been like chosen and she's kind of like begging him to stay and her mom is like refused to show up because you know who wants to send their you know son off to war and so he leaves And Iris works in the local newspaper. She's always wanted to be a writer. And there is this other young young man, um, Roman Kit, who he also works at the newspaper. And they are constantly battling it out for which stories they're going to write. And, you know, this is a perfect time to be a writer. There's a war going on. You know, they live in a small town. And there's lots of things to report on for the the news. And um, Iris ends up, I'm getting foggy on specifics, but she ends up leaving the newspaper and she joins kind of the war front, and they send war correspondents to be writers on they the front. They have magic typewriters. Yes, I was I was waiting for the magic <laughs> typewriter reveal. And so they both write on typewriters because, you know, it's kind of historical, like, in the past. And so their typewriters are connected. So after Iris's brother goes off to war, she sends him all these letters, but never hears anything back. But, you know, it's war, so she doesn't really think too much about it until someone writes her back. And she kind of sends the letters under the dresser in her room and kind of just, like, tucks them in there. Like, um, not her, Roman, sends the, he's been receiving the letters on the other end. And he kind of tucks them away and doesn't respond until one day she kind of sends this beautifully written letter, which Rebecca Ross is just insane, her writing style, because she's writing all these letters as them. Wow. And it's just gorgeous. And so he responds to her and she kind of sends things back. So then they're messaging back and forth. And so he uses the name Carver. So he knows that it's her, but she doesn't know it's him. And they go to work every day. And then one day Iris decides to join the war front. So she messages Carver and says, I'm leaving. Like, maybe don't write to me because I don't know if I'll get them anymore. And it's pretty cool. So he ends up staying at the newspaper for just a little while longer and we see her on the war front, you know, being a correspondent there, which is really cool. I, the way they build up the setting of the war is very interesting. And then he ends up joining her on the war front because um, he had gotten, uh, arra- he had an arranged marriage set up at home. Right. That's right. I yeah. forgot about yep. that. And like, he was miserable. His dad was like, we don't really want you working at the newspaper anymore. You're going to marry this girl. Like we need to, because he's a wealthier family. And right, so, and the girl was also from a wealthy yeah, family and, whose but, the father thought that the two businesses should merge mm-hmm. or type and thing. And even like she didn't she didn't want to get married either. So mm-hmm. he ends up he runs away, joins the war front as well, and 
they're there together being war correspondents for this other newspaper and they end up meeting this woman they stay in her house and I, it's both like beautiful and like tragic because of course it's set during a war so all these things happen you know like they end up in the like in the trenches once and this whole battle is just going on around them and she still hasn't heard from her brother so she doesn't know where her brother is and I don't know. I feel like if I say more, I'll give it away. But right. it was just so magical, like the setting, the characters, um, even all the writing. And eventually, of course, Iris and Roman fall in love. Um, you know, they've kind of always had that like banter connection type. Right. But it's just so, so good. And it's one I wish I could read again kind of for the first time. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really liked that one as well. And I went on to read like um, she had an Irish or no, a Scottish kind of adult series. Oh, really? Yeah, I read that. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. And then um, I read the second one mm -hmm. in that series, too. I, yeah, I also read the second one. for I did it and I counted it towards the class again. And I, I didn't love the second one. I mean, the, the writing was still beautiful and everything. But I mean, I, I can't say too much, but a lot of the time they spend apart. Right. Too. And like part of the appeal of the first book for me was like the, their bond and the way that they worked together. Right. And like they just had such respect for each other as, you know, as equals. But um, it felt a little repetitive too, right. to me. Yeah. I didn't like the second one as much as the first one. Either. Yeah. And the first one just does such a good job of like drawing you in and, right. you know, establish. It's hard sometimes too when it's like a fantasy book like that to do world building in one book which that's like a lot of books like like Fourth Wing and like Court of Thorns and Roses, like they draw out all these books because you want to create this beautiful setting in a right. high fantasy book. But she does it so well in the first one that when they get to the second one, I felt like there was almost too much mm -hmm. of the same. Yeah. Feels like a lot of exposition too. Yeah. You know, trying to get so many details that it can kind of weigh down the plot. Mm -hmm. But no, it was just, and I, I loved, I loved Roman and Iris. They were just great protagonists. And I sometimes I see people check it out, and I just want to like run up to them and be like, I love that book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought it was interesting because it kind of gave a historical vibe, but yet yes. the whole thing with the gods and everything mm -hmm. is almost a little dystopian. Yes. So it was a little bit of a mix-up. And some, not some, mix up, mash up, I sometimes guess. Sometimes when it comes into like building a um, like mythology like that, it's like very hard to follow. But that's one that they kind of combine it through like um, real books from the story. Like, right. As she like because they're learning, too, about the gods, you know. And so they'll read books at the library or like they'll have um, like resources from like interviews and things. And they share those to kind of help build that mythology, which is also really cool. Right. And then I think in the second book, you even, like, hear from the gods themselves. Right. Which is also, it's just, like, very well done in yeah. two short books. Right. Wow. All right. Well, thank you, Megan, for joining us today. Of that course. That was really fun. Yeah. We'll have to have you on another time. So I just want to let you know we're back to our two episodes per month. It's September. Our next guest is going to be Patty Utaro, who's the director of Monroe County Library System, and she is also an avid reader. So if you like our podcast, leave us a review, email us suggestions. We always like to see what you guys are thinking about. Um, and as always, all the links to the books that Megan and I talked about are in our show notes with links to the library catalog and to Hoogla or Libby if they're on it or bookshop.org if you want to purchase them. So thanks so much and we'll see you soon. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.